Cross Church. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're about to enter in. Would you turn around to someone near you and tell them good morning? Let them know it's good to see them. Welcome into the house of the Lord today. Today is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We have the privilege of worshiping King Jesus and lifting him high and exalting him in this room. So let's just turn our attention, our affection to the King of Kings. Lord, you are Lord of all. We look at you this morning. We exalt you, Jesus. Would you come and inhabit the praises of your people? Come make our hearts your throne this morning. Come rest upon each one of us, Lord. You're worthy of our worship. You're worthy of our praise. We exalt you in this place. Would you have your way, God? Amen.
song in the spirit this morning. give the Lord permission this morning? Would you let the walls down of life and let the Lord speak to your heart today? Today is a day of impact. There, God is in the midst of us and he wants to, I feel like his holy finger, like the finger of God is here to remove, to deliver, to bring healing the very finger of God. I feel like the Lord's hand came into the room and he wants to touch lives today. So lift up our expectation, but not not on people, but on the Lord. Lord, we're, we're here. You're here. We invite you in. Would you pray the most dangerous prayer I know? Just, just kind of open your hands a little bit. We are going to take communion here in a moment, but just open your hands a moment. Just It's the most dangerous prayer I know. <laughs> and it just goes like this. Holy Spirit, come. Because you are inviting him to come and wreck you. That's what's going to happen. Okay? So just open your hands. Let your heart be in a place of receiving. Say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Take your rightful place. Holy Spirit, come. Take your rightful place. We enthrone you. We adore you. Our lives laid before you. Holy Spirit, come. Seek your rightful place. For we adore you. We enthrone you. Our lives laid before you. Come and seek your rightful place. the way in today, you would have received the communion elements as you walked in the door. But if you didn't get those, all you got to do is just lift your hand up. The ushers are walking up the aisle. They'll make sure that you get some. If you would go ahead and just take out the the wafer there, the piece of bread, just hold it before yourself. We're going to take it together. Hey, I just want to tell you this morning, you're not alone. I know sometimes life feels lonely, like you're fighting a battle and you're on your own. You're not. You're not alone. The Lord is with you. He he is mighty in you. Can I get an amen this morning? You got that piece of bread? Did we miss anybody? Did everybody get some? All you got to do is wave and the ushers will see you. So, Okay. If you take that piece of bread out. Lord, in your presence this morning, you're here in the midst of us and we're so grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Would you encounter each heart today? On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He passed it out to each one of his disciples. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. And so, Lord, this morning, we're so, so thankful that you took all sickness, all death, all brokenness. You took it upon your mortal body. By your stripes, we are healed by the bruises, our iniquities are cured. 
Lord, you knit us together this morning as one. And so we just acknowledge and declare, this is the body of Christ. Would you just declare that with me? This is the body of Christ. We receive it today in faith. Go ahead, take, eat. In a like manner, he took the cup. So this is a cup of a new covenant in my blood. And every time we come together, we're supposed to do this. We're supposed to remember. We're supposed to declare and believe the blood and declare it until he comes again. Amen. So, Lord, this morning we hold this cup. The fruit of the vine, Lord, we hold it. We declare that your blood is enough, Jesus. We're so grateful. Thank you for the new covenant. Thank you for the new covenant. Thank you for the new covenant, Lord. Would you declare this with me? This is the blood of Jesus. Would you please take and drink each one? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Would you take those cups, just pass them down the road to somebody and kind of get them out of your hand. And There's two things I want to do this morning, okay? First of all, you need to jump to your feet. We are going to worship the Lord here in a moment with one last song of praise you know that we cannot end a worship service in the low place. We have to exit in joy. Amen? But as you stand up, would you please put a hand on someone near you? Okay? Okay, it's the blood of Jesus that releases a divine mercy. And His mercy overcomes judgment. And it is part of our role as the body of Christ to declare to one another the mercies of the Lord. Amen? So would you just declare the fresh mercy of God over their life this morning? Say, I declare Jesus' mercy over you. Be forgiven, be washed, be cleansed. We declare the blood of Christ over your life. Be set free. All brokenness, all sickness, be delivered of it this morning in Jesus' name. Come on, church, is your amen behind these declarations? All right, let's declare the goodness of God in the land of the living, amen? Come on, let's do it.
And all God's people said, amen. Hey, before you sit down, why don't you greet two or three next to you? Well, good morning. Welcome to the house. My name is Steve Smith. I'm one of the pastoral elders here at the house. We're getting ready to take up our tithes and offerings. So if you want to prepare there, prepare that. There's ways to give up on the screen. Um, while you guys are preparing that, I'd ask to welcome up Evie for some announcements. Good morning, the house church. I have just a couple quick announcements for you. First thing is this May, May 3rd through the 5th, we have our CREATE conference. I just want to reiterate what Pastor Jamie was saying last week. Jesus prayed on earth as it is in heaven, and we have the opportunity to partner with heaven to bring creative solutions around us, and that's what this conference is about, unlocking you to create. And it's not just for like the artists, musicians, painters, this is for everyone. So if you have breath in your lungs, you are made to create something, come on out. Use the QR code, um, register for our Saturday um, sessions, and I hope to see you there. Our second announcement is our kids are growing. We are having babies at a fast pace. We need your help. Come on out to the lobby after service, meet with our volunteers. They're going to tell you more, sign up for our kids team. That is all I have for you today. If I could get the ushers to come forward, if you guys can stand, we're going to make a declaration over our offering. As we receive today's offering, we are believing you for heaven opened, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created. Dreams and visions, angelic visitations, declarations, impartations, and divine manifestations. Anointings, giftings, and calls, positions and promotions, provisions and resources to go to the nations, souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revelation. Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you will shower favor, blessings, and increase upon me so I have more than enough to co-labor with heaven and see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah. If you guys could help me welcome up Pastor Jamie. Good morning. Go ahead and grab a seat there. As we're, uh, as you're, we're prepping and pre- uh, preparing to give offering as that's going by right now, I want to give an opportunity for us as a community. We are a missional community. You're going to hear it from the stage today in a different way uh, because of our, our guest, but the way that it's articulated, I 100% agree with. You just got to know. We are a community that is on a mission. We're a family that is on a mission. And, uh, and that mission is to see this world come under the lordship of Jesus. Right? Are you alive? Okay. <laughs> thought we'd for sure agree on this one. At least this is the first thing. <laughs> but what that means, what that often means is that we are, as a community, laying hands on apostolically and sending people into the nations. And this morning, we have the opportunity as a community to be able to commission and release a team into the nation. So I'm going to invite that team to come on up on stage real quick. Uh, Elders, if you guys could join me as well. I know there's a few of us here to uh, lay hands on these guys. To commission, to lay hands on is a place of impartation where God's grace that rests on this house rests on them. 
That is a significant and real thing. But also the assignment of this house, what God's given us as an assignment. These guys are like an arrow being shot into the nations. And so it's very important that our community gets behind that. We're not just sending someone off to war and then backing off. Amen. We we are a community that rallies in prayer and is in agreement with God's purpose. Amen. All right. Dave, would you just share what you guys are doing? Thanks, Pastor. Hey, it's uh, an honor to be here, as always. We get the privilege. This crazy team gets to go to Honduras. So next Saturday, we'll be, yes. Come on, give God praise. You know, I was thinking about it this morning, Jamie. The last time we were in Honduras was 2000, the year 2000. We did a whole nation in one day, had the main arena in the, in the nation where it was filled to overflowing. There were 30,000 people outside the stadium that could not get in. So this time, uh, they're doing one nation, one day. There will be 17 different events taking place throughout the nation during this whole week's process. We have one city. We're hooking up with our good friends, Ted and Julie Trandall. uh, And we're going to go down there for a whole week, get into the schools, get into the clinics, uh, get into the hospitals, prisons. And then we're going to have two nights of open-air miracle crusade for the city. So we're going to do a citywide event. We covet your prayers. We really do. I am so thankful for the House family, how you guys have supported us, obviously financially, but in your prayer life also. I mean, the stories just from the last couple of weeks of health issues that are going on, uh, attacks on vehicles, wash machines, refrigerators. The enemy's not happy about what we're doing. And uh, we covered your prayers. We are believing God, just as Pastor Jamie said this morning, that souls and more souls are going to be saved. That's the reason we're going. This is not, nothing fun about this. It's all work, buddy. It's work. My friend Leif's going to come up here shortly, and it's, this is all work, brother, right? But it's all for the glory of God. It is. So we, we covet your prayer, so please keep us in prayer as we head out this Saturday. And again, we'll be there all week long. Would you guys, okay, we're going we're gonna to pray for these guys, so feel free to extend your hands towards them if you want to join in that way or just wherever you're at here. Lord, in this place, in this morning, Lord, we trust in the covenant of Christ, the new covenant, that in spirit, Lord, you, there, there is connection with heaven that needs to be released in the nations. And we thank you for the opportunity to do that. It's a community for this team. So, Father, as, as your ambassador, Lord, I just lay hands on each one of them. We lay hands on each one of them. Lord, thank you. And we commission them today. We commission them today. Go into this nation and release the kingdom. Release the apostolic mission. Release the reality of heaven that those who do not have hope will gain hope. We decree that whatever grace this house carries, that you would also carry it into the nation. The covering of all that God has decreed over us, we also decree it over you, that the Lord is with you. His angels go before you to prepare good works and that you are going to see miracles, signs, and wonders. You're going to see the dead raised. You will see the leopard cleansed, the demon come out. You will see souls and more souls from this nation coming forth, every generation. We thank you for that, Lord. We decree these things over them. We commission them that they would be fruitful and that they would come back safely. We decree your divine protection over them in Jesus' name. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for that, Lord. We pray these things right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you agreed with that, you said, amen. Amen. Come on, can we say thank you to these guys? Come on. God bless you guys. Do it. All right. Straighten out these three chairs. These chairs are dangerous, by the way. You are going to find out why in just a few moments. Okay. Hey, uh, we have a great privilege today to host a dear friend of this house. And uh, so there's a a short video that helps to introduce him. And so if you would give your attention to the screen, I'll be right back up in a moment to bring him up. 
one night this one lady with a burqa, she opened up the burqa. She looked at me with tears in her eyes and she said, how long have you known about this Jesus? And I was just thinking my country, Norway, we just celebrated 1,000 years since Christianity came. She said, why didn't you come earlier? Why didn't you come earlier? Well, we wait for the second coming. Let them experience the first coming of Jesus. To make my story short, uh, I have had the honor and the enjoyment of traveling to 106 countries and continue to going into the Middle East. But God, in the middle of it, have given me some uncommon favor. Like as the first Christian to be able to speak at the Bachai Mosque, uh, to be a professor at Sharia Law College. And then eventually, I remember November 24th of last year, then I had the opportunity to receive the International Peace Award by the President of Pakistan and on the award it says, as an ambassador of love. But I have the honor of being a Joseph to Pharaoh, to be able to bring the Sunni Muslim, the Shia Muslims, the Hindu Pope's representative. We are bringing them together to soften the tone and to bring a ministry of reconciliation. And I've been speaking at 27 of these events worldwide. And what is actually taking place, it has given me such an uncommon favor with different nations. Here we're bringing the influencers of the influencers together. We had a whole group of people. We honor those people. We're sitting at the table. We get to know each other. And as a result, in the middle of all of that, I get to represent a God that looks like Jesus and building bridges over to them to be able to then in the next moment, just like Joseph with wisdom going in and solving some of the problems they have that gives favor with God, but it also brings favor with them. So after 27 years of investing in relationship, this Cairo's moment is over the Muslim world and the cry of Ishmael is being heard by the father. And I don't know if you realize it, but Ishmael means God hears. And he was the first one that was named before he was born and only three people and God named him God hears. Why? Because God is going to hear the cry of Ishmael. And I'm asking you, would you consider to be part of that? As I have an opportunity and you have an opportunity, we have an opportunity to bring fresh water to Ishmael in the wilderness, to be able to invest in some of the most influential Muslim leaders, to be able to bring them together in unity, but also it's going to give us an opportunity on a grassroots movement to be able to help the persecuted church. But just like this woman and the 1.8 billion other ones, we do have an opportunity to take the light into the darkest places. We do have an opportunity to invest in love. Part of my calling is to making sure that Ishmael receives the good news of Jesus. Will you help me? Would you please help me welcome to the stage Dr. Leif Hetland. You extend your hands towards him. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for life. We thank you, Lord, as a spiritual father to this house and to Nicole and I, for what's been imparted to us that's being stewarded. We all are benefactors of, Lord, we give thanks for that. And Lord, we pray right now that you would return that back to life a hundredfold, Lord. That, that, uh, that your presence would shine so brightly in and through him, that you'd rejuvenate and strengthen him today. And Lord, I am asking that today that you would release the presence of your spirit in ways that we long for. And I would give, we just yield, Lord, we give permission. Holy Spirit, speak through Leif today. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Dr. Leif Hetland. Just wave to me and smile, everyone. <laughs> I just have to look at all of you happy people. <laughs> Wow. Say wow. wow. Say it backwards. Wow. Say it upside down. Wow. Oh, you're doing very well. It's just taking a few moments for me just to look at you. Uh, there's these beautiful, bright, shining lights here. So it just takes a few moments just to connect. But it is such a privilege for me to be back again. Uh, how many of you have heard me speak before? Let me see. Ah, oh, there's about a half of you. 
Yeah, I, I just thought at least sharing just a few moments that about 18 years ago, around this time period, there was a seed, a small little group of people that met in a home, and, and the very thing called the house today was started. That was about 18 years ago. And less than a month afterwards, I was with my friend Bill Johnson and Randy Clark. We were doing this event at Hosanna Lutheran Church, and uh, I connected at that time here with Jamie and Nicole 18 years ago. So you started to see just this little seed that has become this beautiful tree that is just full of fruit. And I just, uh, so for me, it's an incredible honor because I have been walking for 18 years on this journey. We have traveled the world together. We have seen the good, bad, and the ugly side of each other. And uh, so we... <laughs> But it, but it is beautiful when you do life, and we have been spending the last couple of days just reflecting on, on, on just the importance of relationship and just doing life together. And uh, so we've been weeping together, we've been laughing together. And uh, for me personally speaking, I, I remember when I walked into this sanctuary when you had the opening of this sanctuary, and we were we were doing another event and was sneaking in and was just watching you worshiping Jesus and. Whatever overwhelms you will shape you. And my heart is that you're going to get so overwhelmed by Jesus that nothing else can overwhelm you. And so I'm living, I'm living my life with a very simple assignment. I'm going to actually be, try to be focused, but this is going to be a creative miracle for me to share, uh, share this message that I have. Because the, the message on the three cheers is actually this thick of a book. So it's, it's actually a book called Call to Rain. So it started with me, started with one message. It became about 12, and then it became 24, and then it became 36. But since you're listening so fast, you're going to get it in 30 minutes and 12 seconds. <laughs> but I'm actually just, I'm putting about a 15 minutes framework. But I feel I have a very special word for you and for us in this season. But I feel the framework is very important. So let me put the perspective, and that is that I live with a very simple focus with my life. I want everyone in the world to know how good Papa God is. I, I, I want everyone in the world to know how loved they are. I want everyone to experience a God just like Jesus. And the Father, He loves you just the way you are. But He refuses for you to stay that way. Because he wants you to be just like Jesus. And so this has been part of my simple assignment for all of those years. Uh, I've been married now for 35 years. And many times when you kiss your wife goodbye and when the children were young and you went into the darkest places, what motivated me was a God that loves this world so much. But I want him to experience it. And this is 9 out of 10 Muslims, including in this region and area, have never met a Christian. And so we wonder, why is there so much darkness? Because of lack of light. And we don't have a darkness problem in America, but lack of light. And if we are in the light business, every time there is darkness, your stocks should go up. And so I just wanted to put something into perspective. So anyway, so I had these three chairs with me. And it's going to help us with a worldview. Uh, uh, Jamie called me Dr. Leif Hetland. I'm, I'm not using this title, so I kind of smile. But just a little over two weeks ago, I defended my doctoral thesis. And uh, yes. And, and so I officially actually became a doctor. But here's what I wanted to say, because I have another title. I have a, we were joking, but I have one. It's called a demon, which is not a demon. I have a THD, which is a theology doc doctor. But I have my favorite title is DLH, Daddy's Little Helper. <laughs> I'm just a little boy with a big, big papa. And I want to make sure my sonship is before my leadership or apostleship or any other ships. So I wake up in the morning being a son of Papa God and just hearing his voice and seeing his face, feeling his love. Because if you don't feel his love, you're looking for love in the wrong places. If you have any love deficiency in your life, you have a God deficiency. Because God is love, 1 John 4, 16. So anyway, so would you help me this morning for this creative miracle? 30 minutes and 15 minutes with a framework of this message. So this is chair number one. Which chair is this? Oh, very good. Say chair number one. 
Oh, excellent. Chair number two, which chair is this? And there's some of you, uh, I can maybe help you. I see a couple of you. This is chair number two. Which chair is this? Ah, oh, very good. I, I think you got it. And this is chair number three. Which chair is this? What I'm going to try to do is to describe the whole world into these three chairs. Actually, everyone in this room, you're either chair number one, chair number two, and hopefully not chair number three. If you're in chair number three, there is some good news for you. You can become a chair number one believer. So I just want you to know that. So chair number one is all about the kingdom of God. Say kingdom of God. Over 8 billion people in this world, actually 8.1 billion people, either chair number one, chair number two, chair number three. Everyone in Minnesota, chair number one, two, or three. If you run a business, it's either chair number one business, chair number two, or chair number three. If you're married, chair number one, two, or three. So chair number one is about the kingdom of God. Say kingdom of God. Chair number two is about the kingdom of self. Say kingdom of self. And chair number three is about the kingdom of the world. Say kingdom of the world. If you live your life in chair number one, it is the spirit-filled life. Say spirit-filled life. And you are saved. Say saved. If you live your life in chair number two, you are saved. Say saved. I had an assembly of God pastor. He came up to me and says, I don't believe that the person in chair number two could be saved. And I said, that's okay. In your sermon, it can be lost. In mine, they are saved. <laughs> and then he came up and he said, are you saying I cannot lose my salvation? I said, you can lose whatever you want to. <laughs> I am describing in chapter number one is what Paul called a carnal Christian, a soulish Christian, the person who are living their life. Congratulations. <clears throat> Congratulations. If you are in chapter number two, you will get to heaven. But the sadness for me is you will not get heaven to you. And then there is chair number three, the people are lost, say lost. And the majority of the world population, they live their life in chair number three, they are lost. They do not live in the light and in the love of what God has for their life. The majority of Minnesota live their life in chair number three. And you have maybe 1.8 billion Muslim, over a billion Hindus, over 600 million Buddhists, and I could go on and on and on. But it could be the average neighbor, most of the people in your classroom, they're living in chair number three. Chair number one, as I said, is the spirit-filled life. Say spirit-filled life. The Bible says, walk in the spirit, and when you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of your flesh. If you live your life in chair number one, the supernatural is actually what's natural. If I squeeze you and you are in chair number one in traffic in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, what's going to come out of your life is love and joy and patience. (laughs) This wonderful fruit of the Spirit is just coming out of your life. If you're in chair number two, you're going to start to feel anger and frustration and you will hunt the horn. So chair number one, uh, as I'm saying, it is about the kingdom of God and the kingdom is in the spirit. The Bible says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. When you are in chair number one, you're full of power. Say power, Power. love, Love. and wisdom that comes from a sound mind. So chair number one, when I'm in chair number one, this is my resting place. Say resting place. It's called the hard work of rest. And rest becomes your weapon of warfare. And out of rest, you're actually wearing the enemy out. When I'm in this chair, I see my father's face. When I'm in chair number one, I hear my father's voice and I am prophetic. When I'm in chair number one, I feel his love. I'm experiencing his love. And I'm living fully loved. And nothing can separate me from my father's love. When I'm in chair number one, the dove is resting there. Say dove. And that's a picture of the Holy Spirit. Because when I'm at rest, I'm becoming a resting place for the Holy Spirit. But chair number two is a little bit different. When I am in this chair, as I'm saying, I'm at rest. Chair number two, for me personally speaking, there is no longer peace and I'm restless. It is not that God does not speak when I'm in chair number two. But in chair number one, it is spirit soul, body, and there is river and life. The problem in chapter number two, it is soul, spirit, and body. And when God speaks, it has to filter its way through your soul, your emotion, will, mind to touch your spirit. So when I'm in chapter number two, I'm not sure, is this God, the devil, or myself? 
And there is a division within me. When I am in chair number two, there is this, there is none like me. My friend Lenny LeBlanc said, no, 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 there is none like you. There's a big difference between the chairs. But the people in chair number two, I, I remember this lady in Australia. She came up to me and says, Pastor Leif, I traveled all the way here to Byron Bay to see you. And I had seen you on Sid Roth and I, I couldn't wait to hear you teach. But these young worshipers, they continue and they jump and they dance. And they continue for over two hours. And I can be honest with you, I didn't like it. And I said, that's okay. Uh, they didn't worship you. They were worshiping him. But so many people in Chennai, but give me, touch me, bless me, fill me. And if I don't like it, I, I, I get divorced and I find another orphanage. Because we do not realize we operate with an orphan heart and an orphan spirit. And self is in the center of my life. And even in marriage, it's all about what that spouse is going to do for me. If not, I'm withholding love. And then as a result of this is that the majority of this will have not rejected Jesus, but have rejected this version of Jesus. And so I'm just going to put a little bit into a frame because today, my heart with the message today is eventually, I want us just to take a little bit look at Jesus. After a little of the complication I did with my doctoral thesis, I'm back to the basic. I just want to be with Jesus. The best thing about Jesus is Jesus. I don't have any agenda, and I have a grandson and a granddaughter, but my grandson who is 10 months, no, excuse me, 10 weeks old, little Malaga, he, he was five pounds, and now he's 10 pounds, and I'm holding him in my hand, and I'm looking at him, and he's looking at me. There's no agenda. The whole world shuts out, because what you are beholding, you're becoming, and what you become is what you release. We teach what we know, but we reproduce who we are. So chair number one is learning to be with him. And then the one you're with is the one you become like. You become like him. And then eventually you do what he does. And it starts to make an impact. So I've been going back again to the basic of the gospel. And there's one story we're going to look. But we're going to see it from chair number one. And we're going to see how Jesus is so different than, than chair number two. It's like one of my friends, he built a 3,000 church. Great, successful church. A lot of people know about it, but it was a chair number two church. And he told me, I didn't even know that chair number one existed. Chair number one, you're living from love. Chair number two, you're living for love. Chair number two is all about achieving. Chair number one is all about receiving. Because it comes from him, it goes through him, it goes back to him. It says a whole different operating system. Because in the orphan world in chair number two, I do. Say I do. Then I have. Say I have. Then I become. Say I become. But chair number one is very different. Say I am. And because of who I am, I already have. Say I have. And because of what I have, I do. Say I do. It is not what you do that makes you who you are. It is who you are that makes you do what you do. In chair number two, you will ask God to bless what you are doing. In chair number one, you're doing what God is blessing. I just want us to see this paradigm so that we can see scriptures from this perspective. So anyway, so this story, when I'm in chair number one, I'm anointed. Say anointed. When I'm in chair number two, I'm annoying. Say annoying. You can ask my wife about it. <laughs> Even my dogs like me better in chair number one. My dog is like. <laughs> in chair number one, I am prophetic. Say prophetic. But in chair number two, I am pretty pathetic. I, I just give you one example. Years ago, I was speaking at Bethel Reading at the prophetic conference. And it was an amazing time. And the speaker before me, his name is Sean Boltz. And he's a very, very dear friend. And Sean, at that moment, operated clearly from chair number one. And the prophecy was so detailed that you couldn't have Facebook or anything else. But the details that he gave over people was almost like, what do you have in your wallet? And I was sitting there in awe and in awesomeness. That's my brother. And then somebody right behind me, I was the next speaker, tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, you're going to have to follow that. 
So what happened? In a moment, the dove lifted and pigeons came in. And pigeon religion is different than when the dove is there. So in the next moment, when I'm sitting there and waiting is, oh, I'm going to have to follow that. And then I'm thinking, oh, do I have any word? And oh, let me see. And then you say, oh, maybe somebody have a back problem. Somebody watching Bethel TV have a back problem. <laughs> I'm just saying, it is so silly when you try to use somebody else's armor. So don't be a copy. Be an original. Be yourself. Everybody else is occupied. So what I realized what was happening is I went from a place of living full of love. Then fear comes in. And Chena Batu is always rooted in fear. And then fear has some friends. Shame and guilt comes in. And then shame will remind you who you are not. In Chena Batu, the Father will always speak to your identity of who you are. And shame is a liar. And shame starts to tell me who I'm not. And I start because orphans compete with one another. Sons and daughters complete one another. But I was so glad I knew about the cheers in the next five minutes. I repented. Say repent. So I went back into the penthouse where I belong. Repent. <laughs> Why would you want to have to live in the orphanage here when you can live in the family here with the father? <laughs> so when I went up, I actually did the three cheers and how to do prophecy from chair one compared to chair two. And the difference this look, because when I'm in this chair, I don't see, here I see how big Goliath is. In chair number one, I saw how big God is. When I'm seeing here, I see the terrorist Saul in the Middle East. When I'm here, I see the Apostle Paul. Because you don't treat people based upon their history, but their destiny. And you're speaking life into people in the world that is around you. If I'm in chair number two, if you touch the lepers, you become unclean. If you're in chair number one, you touch the lepers, they become clean. And I could just go on and on. But this is just setting up the frameworks. So you can see the difference between when you're living in love. Receiving love, becoming love, and giving love. A God that loves this world so much that he gave his only begotten son. So the scripture verses we're going to look at today. This has been touching me. We're going to look in John chapter 4. And I'm going to talk through this process a little bit. But I feel it is verses, not just for you, but I think it is verses for our time that we're living in. How many of you know there's a lot of shaking going on in the world? Just how many of you have had some shaking going on in your life? I want you to know that chair, no, chair number two is being shook these days. And chair number three is being shook. But chair number one is actually an unshakable place. Because you build your life up on an unshakable kingdom. You build your life up on an unchanging person. His name is Jesus. And here you're finding your resting place. I'm not saying that there is not storms in your life. But you can be like Jesus to bring your cushion in the middle of the culture storms. And Jesus was resting in the storm. In the middle of the storm, there was water in the boat. So it was a physical storm. There was wind. It was a physical. There was an emotional storm. They were afraid. And there was a spiritual storm. Where are you, Jesus, in the middle of it? It was real, but all the disciples ended up in chair two, and they were so, they were drowning and full of fear in the storm. While Jesus brought his cushion, he was resting in the middle of the storm. And you can speak to the storm that is around you when you no longer have a storm on the inside. So my encouragement is when you get to chair number two, and all of us will, in a moment I'm coming into this chair, and I've been there a few times in the last week. And it just in a moment I can be there and there's peace and there's presence. And then I get that phone call or there is that offense. Or, and before you know it, I get right in this place. I feel restless, irritable, and I'm starting to be overwhelmed by all the news. And here's what's happening with Hamas. And here's what's going on with Iran. And I'm getting a call from one of my Muslim imams. And before you know it, I'm in the middle of this storm. And at that moment, instead of having condemnation, it is an invitation. Well, the enemy wants to blackmail you. Oh, you did it again. And then the enemy will start to remind you and he starts with shame and he starts to, and then you start to medicate. And there's two ways, either religion or rebellion. So either here because there is pain in your life and the pain seeks pleasure. And the two ways usually in general, between, either you're going to do more, to have more, to become more, and you're going to press in more. I'm going to stand on the word of God and I'm going, la la la. 
And you don't know, realize it comes from a place of fear. Or you're going in to medicate those different areas that is not comfortable with love. Instead of what God is doing, because you think that God cannot handle your messes. And part of the reason is we have a view of God that doesn't look like Jesus. Who's always stepping into the messes in our life. And the safest place you can be when you're in chair number two, where he says, come to me, all of you who are in chair number two, weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, my burden, not yours, my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Learn from me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm low and meek and humble in heart. I have a different way of operating. In this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So let me just talk through this episode. In John chapter 4, Jesus decided he's going to go into Samaria. Let me just describe the background. Samaria is not the place you want to go into. It is the one you want to go around. I mean, so when you're talking about the Samaritans in today's culture, first of all, Jews don't hang around Samaritans. And you can maybe put down on your list of who that group is in your life. So if you were asked people in China, but two, stay away from Samaritans. Don't you know that person is the head of the Democratic Party? <laughs> or don't you know, and you can just make, he is so and so. I mean, I have it all the time. I mean, or you don't understand, you're a Norwegian. <laughs> they tell me that. <laughs> and you're hanging around sinners, don't you know that? <laughs> Don't you know if you hang around those lepers, you can get leprosy? No, don't you know if the lepers hang around me, they can become clean? <laughs> so I am not talking about, but in this chair, there's this whole thing. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You choose who is the good and who is evil. Instead of coming from the tree of life. So the Samaritan, whatever that group it is, the one that there was some kind of issues. And I'm going to say it was issues that they have, culture issue. So Jesus decided he's going to go right in the middle of that very group. That could be the ones in the project for somebody. Or that could be that color. Or that could be these Norwegians that's taking over Minneapolis. <laughs> that's just my Norwegian humor, by the way. But whoever is those or that group of people. On whatever side it is, that's where Jesus decides to show up. He decides to go right in the middle of the culture storm at a time. You're staying away from Samaritans. He steps right into Samaria and he goes to a place called a well. Say well. Let me put something up on the screen here, would you? And uh, I'm going to slow down because I still have plenty of time. <laughs> Are you guys okay? My goal today is that you're going to experience a God just like Jesus, that you're going to have a fresh new encounter with his love. And you're going to be able, as a result of that encounter, become an encounter so that the world out here that is thirsty right now and is drinking from the polluted water is going to be able from you, for you to becoming a well where these rivers of living water is going to come out of your life and it's going to meet the deepest thirst that is in society right now. That every Muslim is thirsty. Did you know that every single person in this room, you're made of water? 70% of you are water. And Papa Doyle told me yesterday that most of us dehydrated. Because whatever you are made of, you are longing for. And the weakness I did is I had two cups of coffee this morning. <laughs> and not enough water. But I'm pretty this is so I was maybe in chair number two this morning. <laughs> So in the middle of what's going on here, we're longing for water. Why is Jesus choosing when he's going into Samaria? He's going into the projects, going into that camp that you're not supposed to be around. That's culturally, why late would you go and hang around those Muslims? I was just in New York City a couple of months ago. And the top Muslim leader of Pakistan, his wife with a full burqa and his daughter with a burqa. We're walking around in Manhattan. And in a moment, I'm thinking chin number two because I can see all these looks. Who is this blonde-headed guy walking hand in hand with a guy with a long beard? And because you can see in this whole culture, people is like, how could you hang around those people? And that's why I have to go back to the text and just look at Jesus. So Jesus steps right in and he chooses a place called a well. Say well. And the reason is because everybody needs water. Every billionaire in Minnesota, and there's a few of them, 
they are thirsty, they need water. Every poor person, every immigrant, every single person, every Democrat, every Republican, every, everyone needs water. Jesus shows up in the place that is a unifying place of something that every one humanity needs. And that's the place I'm going to come and meet you. I'm just trying to help us with a chair number one lifestyle that looks like Jesus. Because so many times in today's culture, we do not know the difference between chair two and chair one until we look at Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So anyway, so Jesus shows up there at the well, and then there is, on the next picture, as we're going to see, we're going to take a few look at a couple of things. But here at this well, as they are coming together, there is a Samaritan woman. I think it is very interesting. How many of you remember the story from Sunday school about the good Samaritans? I mean, if you just think about the good Samaritan, that says, there's this good Norwegian, by the way. <laughs> what does that say about the rest of us Norwegian? <laughs> I mean, because you're pretty much saying that, hey, there's one good one, but the rest of them are pretty bad. So here was a good Samaritan. What a shock in the culture that you have a good one of those. Oh, there's that good Democrat, or that's that good Republican, whatever side. So we're going in and classify. And the reason was this prejudice. And so here Jesus is coming to a well. And first of all, it was a Samaritan. Say Samaritan. Second of all, it was a woman. And I want you to know this is another culture issue. It took me 22 years before I started to minister to women behind the veil. 22 years of favor before God opened the door for me to go behind the veil and minister to Muslim women. It's a unique favor. You cannot go down and sit down with a Muslim woman. You cannot go and connect. It's called, something called covenant has to take place. You need to be part of family to see them without a veil. Now, I say it was one of the biggest miracles I saw when some of the Muslim imam, they opened up the back doors. I came in, I got to minister to some of their wives. And it was years and years of just learning to love them without a hook. Love them without any agenda. Because perfect love always casts out fear. So here at this well, uh, there's this woman showing up. And this woman has some issues, say issues. And in chair number two, this is the way we have read this passage. This woman had these, these different issues. She have had five husbands. She's now living with somebody else. I mean, she needs a savior. That's kind of our... So our view from chair number two, when we're reading those passages, we have this view, a negative view towards her. We do not realize in the Middle Eastern context that women couldn't divorce. It was the men that divorced. Here's a woman herself that has actually been looking for love. And then every single one of the people that offer covenant that says, I do, broke the I do. And the next one I do. And then another one I do. And after five rounds of this being rejected, she's pretty much homeless and I found somebody to live with. We have to read a scripture from a Middle Eastern perspective. So she is the nobody in society who comes in the middle of the day. And here's another guy that's going to show up. Is this another one that's going to reject me? Everyone out there have a story. And for us... It's so important then that we're coming from chair number one. So when Jesus is there at the well, and then another, here's another thing about evangelism. Jesus says, hey, can you do me a favor? For us to go, when I'm going to the Muslim world, this is part of the evangelism. The old way from chair number two, let me go and say, I have a message better than you. And I'm going to be a salesperson to sell you something. But Jesus from chair number one, he will go to somebody in chair number three that is locked up, that is drinking from the polluted water. And he says, I need something from you. You have something. The homeless have something to teach me. There's something you have that I need in my life. There's something the Muslims have. There's something that Hindu have. There's something every single person there. You have something that I thirst for. So Jesus is showing up in this place and saying, hey, could you give me some water? First of all, he is a Jew. They were not even being around. They were not even being distant. Second of all, she is a woman. And according to the culture issue, the way they saw a Samaritan woman is like they have menstrual period all year around. They are always unclean. 
You couldn't even be near their shadow, but Jesus shows up right in the middle of this woman is considered totally unclean. He's a man, he's a Jew, she's a Samaritan, and then totally different religion. And he's showing up in this place and he starts to say, you have something that I need. I thirst. I'm longing for something. The only other time he says I thirst is on the cross. And again at the cross, you see, every single person out here have something that I want. And I thirst. We're going to get to the solution of this. So anyway, so the story here, and let's look at that. So Jesus comes in and says, hey, can you give me? And she again is so used to people using and abusing. Is this a flirtatious guy? Who is this Jew? What? And then herself, after five rejection, being unwanted, who is this guy? And she's trying to explain these things away. But Jesus comes in, if you had known, chair number one, if you had known who I am, you would ask me for water. And every person in chair number two, you also are drinking from something. And it doesn't matter if that's pornography. It doesn't matter if whatever issue is tomorrow, you have to go to the well and drink again. Finances, whatever, whatever you're doing and drinking from, you're going to be thirsty again and tomorrow you're going to come and drink. There's only one water you can drink that stops the deepest thirst that is in your life. And so many people have been drinking from the wrong water for so long. Because we have not tasted this pure water. That makes us thirst no more. And when you start to drink from that water, there's rivers that start to flow from your life. And wherever the river goes, there is life and there is healing and there is transformation. And it starts to flow. Holy is his water. Anyway, I'm just putting a couple of highlights. This is a long kind of a message. But I want you to say when me, say well. Water. Say water. water. Say word. word. The next thing that Jesus does, because he said, why don't you bring your husband? And again, Jesus is about now he gives the word. Because it's going to be the word of God, the word. He comes with a word of knowledge. And, and she says, I, I don't have a husband. And Jesus then reveal. But this is not condemnation. It is an invitation. So the way Jesus goes about it, no, I know you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands and the one that you're living with right now. I know that you're looking for love in the wrong places. And I know that everywhere that love has been in, everything you've been drinking from, that's why you're coming here to the well. And tomorrow you're going to go to a well and you're going to continue to drink from a well. But whatever it is has not met the deepest root issue in your life. But I have something for you. I have an invitation, not a condemnation. And she starts to talk about the worship. This is a Jacob's well and etc. But Jesus gives her words and it suddenly does something with a word. And that leads to something when he then reveals. She's like, well, maybe one day Messiah is going to come. And because I know you Jews, you can worship there and, and the place where we are at. Because this is all about worship. So from the word brings you to worship. Say worship. Let me just say something about worship. Worship is the only eternal activity we are doing here on earth. What I do of mission exists for one purpose, and that's worship. But what we're going to do for eternity, we're going to worship him. And there's something eternal that is in every single person. Just like I said, because you're made of water, you're longing for water, but you're also made of spirit. When he breathed into you, and the spirit in every person is longing for and is thirsty for spirit. That's why you need to worship in spirit and in truth. But to do that, we need to get rid of the cover-up, the fig leaves, the shame, the guilt. The, we need to get rid of that and be very truthful and say, I got some issues. I'm struggling with something. I'm drinking from the wrong water and it's not meeting my needs. I'm medicated with the wrong things. I need to be honest with it because the worship is spirit and the truth. So what Jesus, from the word, when he reveals who he is, that you recognize what's happening in the next thing, she's becoming a worshiper. And this is the very root thing that Jesus is going after. This is what every single person is worshiping, something. Including the people in chair number two, it's just that self is in the center. And it's interesting what Jesus invites this into is to be a worshiper of the Father in spirit and in truth. You cannot worship the Father in chair number two because you operate with an orphan heart. Wow. 
You need to have the spirit of adoption that says, Abba, Father. And to do that, you need a truth encounter to see you the way that God sees you, to love you the way that he loves you, to wake up in the morning and to look in that mirror and recognize the eyes of love looking at you. And then it led to witness. That's the last W. And for the sake of time, so let's just look at a couple of scripture verses here and we read that together and we have the time so we frame this in. There's a couple of scripture verses. I want us to read that together. Are you guys okay? I hope this is going to be helpful. But it's just, Jesus said to her, everyone, say that with me. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give, he will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. One more. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. And then eventually she says, I do not have a husband. And then Jesus gives the revelation. Let me just get to one more slide and then, for you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Let's look at the next one. But the hour is coming and it is now here when true worshiper will worship the, say Father. Father. Say Father. Father. The world has become a worldwide orphanage. And to be honest, the majority of churches are operating like orphanages. And even orphans are coming together to have visitation because they don't know how to have habitation. Jesus says, I will not leave you as an orphan. John 14, 18, I will come to you. What Jesus came was to restore us back again to the Father. And to deal with the orphan issues in our life. So that you will experience the beautiful gift of sonship and daughtership that says, Abba, Father. So that you can become a worshiper in spirit and in truth. This is what Jesus longed for on the cross when he said, I thirst. I thirst for everyone to know how good my father is and how loved they are. What I thirst for is I want every one of them to experience their father so they can become worshipers in spirit and in truth. Because they were made out of the spirit. And the truth will set them free. And free people will set people free. Because whom the son set free is free indeed. One little picture, and we are landing this in time. Yay! I know we're just putting a framework together of a long message. But if you see here, this is called the Atacamba Desert. It is the driest place in the world. This is in Chile. I'm going to be in Chile in a couple of months. In Chile, South America, it could be about seven years, and there's not one single drop of rain. It looks like everything is drying. I don't know if you have been in chair number two and you've been in dry season in your life. Maybe you came out of even this whole COVID season and you maybe have had a Friday moment and you've had a long, long Saturday, but you're not experiencing Sunday yet. I'm here with some good news. Sunday is coming. I believe that today is going to be a Sunday moment in your life where you're going to experience that underneath when it looked like everything was dying in the Atacama Desert in your soul. When you feel everything is there's still seeds that was broken in the middle of the previous season. That is just waiting for you to come and drink from that water. And one drop of that water when it comes in. Something is about to take place in your life. Something is about to take place in your marriage. In your finances. In your health situation. I want you to see this next picture. Here. In a moment there is this shift. Because there are seeds that has been underneath. That it looked like they were all dying. But instead it were broken. And in a moment it was just waiting for a season change. How many of you, you're no longer what you used to be, but you're not yet become what you're supposed to become? That's called a season change. So we're in the middle of a season change. And here, there's an outpouring of water. And that's what's taking place now in America. It looks like there is dryness in the world. It looks like in this world that right now, everything seems to be dying to some degree. But in the middle of it, we are seeing this glorious home coming up. There's fresh, fresh water that's coming into the wilderness, into the desert. Isaiah 55 is a very beautiful passage to read. But as this water is coming into these different places where those seeds has been broken, you're going to start to see things that's becoming alive. And there's going to be a super bloom harvest over your life. 
over your family, over your finances. You're going to start to see it's happening more and more as we start to drink from that pure water. The ones that is thirsty come and drink. And then rivers is about to start to flow. Can we stand to our feet? Can we just open up for the Holy Spirit? Maybe if you are in this place in chair number three, I don't know what is your story. But you've been looking for love and maybe you're looking for love in the wrong places. I don't know what you have been drinking from, but it has not satisfied. Maybe you have not experienced a Jesus that is coming to meet the deepest root area in your life. And he thirsts for you. He wants you to experience the freedom to be a worshiper in spirit and in truth. Maybe you've been in chair number two. You've been away from his love. Striving. It's been a dry season. You're tired. No longer hearing his voice and seeing his face. It's been this Atankamba, Atakamba desert in your soul. If you're thirsty, we're just going to take a few moments. If that is you, I want to just to release a prayer. We have a few minutes here, but I want you just to come up to the altar and just come up to the altar right now. If you're sensing, I just want the fresh outpouring of His Spirit and I want to come and drink again. We're just taking a few moments. I'm not going to pray for people. We're just going to come and drink. This is where my season, I'm sharing these verses from my own life. I've been dry in the previous season and I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. There's healing in the water. There's freedom in the water. And if you had not received Jesus, could you just wave to me? Could you just wave? If you're chair number three, you're not a born again Christian. You have not received. There's maybe a different reason. I just felt that there's going to be a couple of people this morning. Yes. Is there anybody else? Just, I want to make sure that we cover that. So right now, can we just open up our hands and we cannot give something we didn't receive. I know we all have visited chair number two. We've all been in those places. But today, there's an invitation. There's no condemnation. Don't look in the mirror and see who you are not. Look at Jesus and let him tell you who you are. His beloved son and his beloved daughter. So Father, just now all over this place, I just thank you for my family here at the house this morning. And we are thirsty. In our little desert and our soul, we're just coming to drink and drink. Those who are weary, come. Those who are heavy laden, come. Those who need healing, come. Come to Him. I cannot give you anything. I can just freely receive. I just give what He has. A water. And I just felt also the people in chair number two that you're tired and weary in regard to believing in healing it has not happened just created this place where tomorrow you have to go again and then again and again and just go to that water but today that you're coming to Jesus and allowing him with his healing to just start the flowing into those deepest area in your life so I just release the father's blessing to start to flow over each one of you come home is the invitation of the father drink drink you who are thirsty Beloved, beloved sons and daughters, come home.
there is rain coming. You better hitch up your horses. You better run down this mountain. <laughs> For there is rain coming. Come on, lift up your hope to the Lord this morning. You're the one who meets my needs. You're the one I look to when I'm in need. There is rain coming. <laughs> Come on, wherever you're at in the room this morning, just lift up your hands like you're receiving this morning. I saw before the service even began, I saw the Lord. <laughs> it was like he was looking down at our, our little rabble of congregation here and and there was a smile on his face, and I, I just, I saw promises unlocking, the stuff that like people have longed for, and there was a move of God that was upon us. I saw catalyst moments this morning, and, and this thing breaking open, and there have been prophetic words about the, the massive well, the spring that's here. It's a spring. It's bubbling up. It's a spring of wisdom, that thing that God wants to do. And it's a refreshment to the nations. It's a refreshment to people. And so, Lord, we just, we unlock the spring. We thank you for the fresh rains of your presence. Come to me who are all we. For there is rest for your soul There's a new day upon you <laughs> oh. Wherever you're at right now, would you just reach over, put a hand on someone's shoulder, let them know that they're not alone in this moment. Come on, even just, it doesn't matter if you're up front, up your back there, let's, let's engage this moment. I don't know where life went. That's fine. All right. Lord, we thank you. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. We welcome your presence here, Jesus. We thank you that you're here in the midst of us. We thank you that you're the solution giver. We thank you, Lord, that you are the finisher and author of our faith. We thank you, Lord. You're in the midst of our process. God, you're right there on the journey with us, Lord, and everything that we need. Holy Spirit, you're here. So, Lord, this morning we choose, we choose to turn. We choose to open our hearts. We choose to yield. We choose, Lord, enter back into chair one. Holy Spirit of God, we repent. We turn our hearts. Our dependency is 100 million percent on you, Lord. If you don't provide, we won't win. Lord, we need you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And so, Lord, this morning we decree over every heart that has been opened to you, every heart that's turned, every voice that is lifted and opened and said, Lord, I need you. Every heart that's, that's opened, cracked the door of invitation, and you've, you've said, Jesus, come in. I want to sup with you. He's been knocking. You know he's been knocking. And you've opened the door this morning. All you needed to do was crack the thing open. He's in. Woo, there he is. Lord, we invite you in. Come on, would you just declare with me this morning a simple prayer? Every voice in this house today, every voice, every person, whether it's authentic to your heart or if it's just expression of your mouth, it doesn't matter. The oldest to the youngest, I want you to repeat after me, decree after me this morning. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for me. And so, Father in heaven, I open my life and I surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. I receive this free gift of eternal life. I receive your forgiveness this morning. I have been redeemed by this covenant of Christ. And we say yes and we affirm the blood of Jesus was enough. We receive you this morning, Lord. Holy Spirit, come in. Don't just take up residence for a moment, Lord. Have habitation in our lives. Have habitation in this house, oh Lord. Come and have your way. It's the cry of our hearts, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> For there is rain coming. 
Come on, prophesy. Prophesy over your family this morning. There is rain coming. Prophesy over your business this morning. We are a chair one business. Prophesy over your ministry, over all that you hold, that what's been given to you in stewardship. This belongs to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Here comes the rain. Here comes the rain. Here comes the rain. So, Father, this morning, we thank you. We thank you for all you've done. God, thank you for Leif. Can you guys just say thank you to him real quick? Just thanks, Lord. Father, now I bless your people. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and grant you his holy peace. We decree this this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody who agreed with that said, amen, amen. Come on. Let's give a clap to the Lord this morning. Thank you guys so much for being with us and worshiping. Please make sure you say hi to like five, ten people. Give somebody a high five, a hug, love on them. God bless you guys. You're welcome to come back and worship with us again, second service. We'll see you again soon. God bless you.